On the last panel, we have uh, Carrie McDermott, who is an expert advisor for the Federal Communication uh, Commission. We have uh, Colonel uh, Porpachi, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Telemedicine and Advanced Technology Research Center, and Gail Graham, who is the Deputy Chief Officer for the Health Information Management within the VA, and she's accompanied by Dr. Dawkins and Dr. Breeling. I uh, want to thank uh, you for coming today, and if you could try to um, just summarize your testimony, uh, that would be uh, greatly appreciated uh, uh, as well. And we'll start off with uh, uh, Ms. McDermott. Good morning, Chairman Michaud and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to overview the health care recommendations of the National Broadband Plan. As you know, Congress mandated that the FCC prepare a national broadband plan that shall seek to ensure that all people of the United States have access to broadband capability and include a strategy for affordability and adoption of broadband. The FCC was also asked by Congress to address how broadband can be harnessed to tackle important national purposes, including health care. So here's the cliff notes. The U.S. has serious health challenges. There are promising broadband-enabled health information technologies that have the potential to help us improve health outcomes and quality of life, reduce costs, and extend the reach of a limited supply of healthcare professionals. However, despite the great promise of these technologies, the U.S. lags behind other developed countries in health IT adoption. And so the plan identifies some of these barriers and makes recommendations to address them. They fall into three main categories. First, a connectivity gap. Broadband is either unavailable or too expensive. Second, outdated regulations. Rules that were created when our only interactions with physicians were in their offices, not via remote monitoring and video consultations. Third, misaligned economic incentives. The prevailing fee-for-service reimbursement system pays for volume rather than outcomes and places the financial burden on providers while the benefits are realized elsewhere. So let me briefly overview each. First, connectivity. When we analyzed connectivity for healthcare providers, we found that many providers lack adequate connectivity to support full utilization of health IT. For example, approximately 3,600 small physicians' offices are not even served by existing mass market broadband infrastructure. Of these, 70% are in rural locations. And 29% of rural health clinics do not have access to adequate mass market broadband. The National Broadband Plan addresses the health care connectivity gap by proposing to revamp the FCC's rural health care program. The program is for public and nonprofit health care providers and is the largest sustainable government fund for health care connectivity. Proposed changes include, one, creating a permanent infrastructure fund, two, broadening coverage for monthly recurring costs to all types of broadband services, and three, expanding eligibility for the program. Second barrier, outdated regulations. Dr. Smith highlighted some that the plan addresses, so I'll reinforce one specific to the wireless arena. Regulatory uncertainty surrounding the convergence of communications and medical devices. With new solutions that enable clinicians and patients to give and receive care anywhere at any time comes a new challenge blurred regulatory lines. This uncertainty regarding regulatory frameworks and approval processes can discourage private sector innovation and investment in wireless health and ultimately delay or prevent the availability of such solutions. The plan calls for the FCC and the FDA to build on their long history of collaboration to resolve these issues. The agencies have already begun to act on this recommendation and are holding a joint public meeting on July 26 and 27. Through this forum, we will bring together various stakeholders to begin to better understand the types of devices and applications that are being introduced, clarify the requirements that apply, and improve the regulatory processes to the extent possible. Third barrier, misaligned economic incentives. Within a fee-for-service reimbursement system, providers bear the cost of health IT implementation and changes to workflow, but don't fully capture the economic gains created through improved clinical outcomes. The plan recommends several steps to move toward an outcomes-based reimbursement mechanism for e-care technologies and urges HHS to propose specific programs and reimbursement changes that will help realize the value. Without reimbursement reform, the market for wireless health IT solutions is limited. This, in turn, inhibits investment and innovation. In summation, the National Broadband Plan's health care recommendations address the infrastructure, supply, and demand concerns associated with utilization of promising health IT solutions so that all citizens may realize their health benefits and cost savings. I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Colonel? 
Committee. I'm Ron Porpetich. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you a little bit about the Army Medical Department's mobile health projects, future initiatives, and challenges in implementing these kinds of capabilities, both stateside and overseas. I'd like to focus on three projects, succinctly go over an overview of what they entail. We currently have 11 active projects that we're doing at the Telemedicine and Advanced Technology Research Center, located at Fort Detrick, about 50 miles northwest of Washington. The first project deals with soldiers coming back from the war with a variety of wounds, traumatic brain injury, psychological health. They get care at Walter Reed, let's say, then they go back to their homes to recover. These are reservists and National Guardsmen. The question is how do we reach out to them on a regular basis? We have a care team located at a community-based warrior transition unit. There are nine of them in the states. We are currently up and running as of May of last year at five of these sites located in Massachusetts, Virginia, Florida, um, Rock Island, Illinois, and Alabama, covering 26 states. Many of these soldiers are living in remote areas. We push down onto their own cell phones, secure messages that are HIPAA compliant, that allows us to give them wellness tips on sleep, pain issues, reminders about job opportunities and educational issues, as well as announcements and, and um, overall uh, projects dealing with um, appointment reminders. In the Army, we have about 10,000 missed appointments per month in, currently, and, and again, appointment reminders are a key part of the program as well. This project has been very successful in that we as of one year, and this is in the first of a five-phase rollout, we've got 300 soldiers enrolled in the first phase. We've reached out to over 100 case managers and have generated over 20,000 messages. Of those 20,000 messages, 63% are appointment reminders, 17% are health and wellness tips, and 12% are unit-specific announcements. There are challenges to overcome in doing any of these kinds of projects. We have to, since we're pushing content onto the soldier cell phone, we're not buying them one, we have to deal with over 300 different types of cell phones that are out there, going across four different wireless telecommunications companies. We've been able to work through those challenges at no cost to the soldier. That, however, is important to understand the challenges in just getting to that stage. We are also aware of the need to expand this across uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and the VA, and we've generated discussions at three different VA institutions. The second project I'd like to highlight briefly is Maternal Fetal Health, Text for Baby. It's a public-private partnership that's already been up and running for the last four months. 46,000 women, over 2 million text messages being pushed down onto pregnant women's cell phones. We're going to be rolling this particular project out as a DOD partner, an outreach partner to this program, going to the um, Madigan Army Medical Center at Joint Base lewis McCord in Washington State. We're going to be studying this under a research protocol looking at smoking cessation and postpartum depression, realizing that many of our uh, pregnant mothers are dealing with other children, with the spouse who's deployed, adding new stresses to that, to that uh, mother. The third wireless application, again, is a little bit different than the first two. Here we're pushing video onto a smartphone for a diabetic patient population in hopes of changing behavior to make patients more compliant with home blood glucose monitoring, nutrition, and exercise. This is an, a, a research project approved at Walter Reed Army Medical Center where I practice medicine one day a week. It's been up and running for a year. 170 patients enrolled in this study. We found that of the patients that have the video versus those that don't, only half the people actually looked at the video. But those that did had a statistically significant reduction in their, in their glucose, which is important to realize. Regarding the big army, we want to leverage what the big army is doing. They've gone out to Cupertino looking at Apple and, and, and Blackberry and other labs. The Research Development Electronic Command out of Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, has a big interest in seeing how we can take mobile health onto the battlefield. We're interested in leveraging in Big Army's interest and applying this same capability to further health care outreach within the U.S. Army Medical Department. We also realized, based on a recent document approved, the DOD instruction May of last, of the last month, looking at medical stability operations and realize that the rest of the world's cell phone penetration is even greater than America's when you look at it. Therefore, we see great opportunity in leveraging the cell phone capabilities that we're doing stateside and offering it as potential solutions to the developing world. There are many opportunities, but there are considerable challenges. 
Challenges include integrating this content into an electronic medical record, the security issues that we talked about, the regulatory issues with the FDA, is it a medical device or is it still just a cell phone, and information overload to physicians where clinical business practices have to change. We're committed to developing and expanding mobile health in the military. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to highlight briefly some of the Army Medical Department's accomplishments, and thank you for your continued support to those who serve our nation. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel. Ms. Graham, could you summarize your written testimony? Yes, thank sir. You. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about VA's efforts to deliver optimal health care to veterans in rural areas through the use of innovative wireless health technologies. I am accompanied today by Dr. Adam Darkins, Chief Consultant of Fertella Health Services for the Office of Patient Care Services, who has been referenced multiple times um, during the earlier testimonies, and Dr. James Breeling, Deputy Executive Director, Office of Information and Technology, Department of Veterans Affairs. Wireless technologies are part of an overall continuum of care and not a standalone entity within VA. We are currently undertaking the most significant change to our model of care delivery since the rapid expansion of the community-based outpatient clinics that began in the 90s. But in many ways, this new innovative approach is actually a continuation of the same strategy that VA has pursued to bring care closer to our veterans and make it as accessible as possible. Our mission of veteran-centered care engages veterans, families, health care teams in partnership to improve communication and ensure the needs and the preferences of the patient are met. Delivering optimal treatment to veterans in rural areas involves significant challenges, as have been noted by many previous speakers. Emerging technology and new models of care promise to improve clinical quality and reduce cost. VA is committed to pursuing strategies that will achieve these ends. Our aim is to ensure that our rural veterans receive the same quality care. VA is exploring, exploring applications of wireless technologies to enhance care. For example, um, VA has installed very small aperture terminal satellites on the 50 mobile vet uh, centers that were, were purchased um, recently, which includes which are used primarily in rural areas for veterans outreach and readjustment counseling services to veterans, but can be also used in case of emergency for uh, the provision of care. We also use wireless technology to assist our, our veterans with disabilities with quick access to information and to foster opportunities to live at the highest level of functionality possible. At our medical facilities, we are completing wireless local area network projects to improve the coverage and reliability of mobile devices, including those used for barcode medication administration and laptop computers for our clinicians to use in the delivery of care and the access to uh, VA's electronic health record. VA dental providers are using wireless technology to access software designed to improve point-of-care decision, and this technology significantly improves medication safety by providing important drug interaction analysis and side effect profiles um, for treatment outcomes through a vast knowledge base available at the provider's fingertips. My Healthy Vet, the VA's online personal health record, is yet another area of significant progress for wireless technology. My Healthy Vet provides veterans with online access to VA health care, featuring patient-friendly health education information and wellness reminders for preventive care. A veteran who was an early adopter in the pilot program described the application's impact to his life by saying, I feel more in control and aware of my health care choices. Having veterans as a partner in their health care is essential for the success at VA. VA has awarded a rural health grant to improve access to care by engaging our veterans in co-designing improvements to My Healthy Vet. We have conducted uh, sessions in five rural communities with veterans who suggest specific changes to My Healthy Vet, including the addition of a mobile version of this application. This prototype will be evaluated by veterans in a proof of concept environment, and the second phase of this project will support further meetings with veterans to fe for feedback on visually modeling the complete set of functions they desire. Um, recognizing that many times taking things from the electronic health record or a full view on the Internet um, it has its challenges. Around the world, mobile and wireless devices are increasingly used to connect people to the Internet. In early 2009, VA launched a mobile-friendly version of its Internet website. VA's mobile site tailors key VA com content for mobile devices and is designed to be compatible with multiple bands of cell-based Internet browsers. 
We want to be accessible and transparent to our veterans and their families, wherever they may be. Looking ahead, VA is examining the potential for additional innovative applications targeting specific populations of veterans, such as those with traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, or visual impairments. We also anticipate development of more resources and tools for clinicians and veterans. Like you, VA strives to ensure that every veteran who receives care from VA has access to its world-class care and benefits. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I'm pleased to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you. And uh, since we only got uh, three minutes to go vote, uh, have a, we have a choice of holding everyone here for about an hour or for us uh, submitting uh, questions in writing. So uh, we've decided to submit questions uh, in writing. But I really appreciate uh, the testimony here today. Uh, of this panel and the other two panels, and there definitely will be a lot of questions that we have uh, uh, as well. So I want to thank you very much. This is a very important issue and one that there's a lot of interest in. So without uh, any further ado, I'll close the hearing. Thank you.